So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nick Marshall and I'm the manager of exhibitions and programs at George Eastman Museum. We're excited to present today's virtual artist talk with James Welling uh, in collaboration with Aperture. Programs like this are always strengthened when two organizations can come together to share resources and knowledge. The Eastman Museum would like to thank NEH Cares and Art Bridges for providing invaluable support and funding for us to put together and offer programs like this so that we can make them widely accessible. Uh, next slide, please. We'd also like to thank our members as well as Aperture's members for their continued support of both organizations during these challenging times. The photo community can feel small uh, at times, so it's uh, wonderful to know you're all still out there and believe in the work that we're doing. Today's program coincides with quite a few things going on related to James Welling's most recent work. At the museum, Welling's exhibition Choreograph has been on display since July and will continue through the end of the year. It's a fantastic show that was curated by Lisa Hostetler. If you have a chance to see it in person, we would definitely encourage you to do so. We've taken preventative measures to keep our guests safe, including online ticket sales, mask requirements, and limiting gallery capacities. If you're unable to come in person, you can tour the exhibition virtually through our 3D Matterport tour, which I believe uh, the artist will walk us through a little bit today. In addition to the exhibition of this work, uh, today marks the release of Aperture's beautifully designed and printed publication of Choreograph with an essay by Lisa Hostetler. Congratulations to Jim, Lisa, Leslie, and everyone at Aperture who worked on the project. Uh, the book uh, should be available to purchase soon through Aperture's website, uh, as well as the museum's new store. And we're also excited to announce that the museum is offering a limited edition print from the Choreograph series in our store and online. Uh, and we'll share a link to that shortly. Uh, please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any point throughout today's talk. At the end of the presentation, we will go over as many questions as we can. The chat function, uh, which is the other icon uh, at the bottom of your screen, is open. So if you're uh, having any technical difficulties, please let us know uh, through the chat. Uh, or if you'd like to just say hello, we'd love to hear from you. We are recording today's talk. So if you'd like to watch it again, or if you want to share it with friends and colleagues, the video will be uploaded on the Eastman Museum's YouTube page within the next week. And Aperture will also have it available. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Leslie Martin, Creative Director at Aperture. Thanks very much, Nick. And thank you to the George Eastman Museum and to all of the members and donors who are here on, online, as well as those um, members of Aperture who may be joining us. Just a quick word about what Aperture is. Um, Aperture believes that photography is vital to society and contemporary culture. And as a not-for-profit publisher, we connect audiences to visionary photographers like Jim Welling and thinkers who shape our perceptions of the world. And uh, we are delighted, uh, Nick, thank you for the introduction, um, to be publishing this beautiful volume choreograph with James Welling. Um, very exciting to have this body of work in print form and available with the contextualizing essay of Lisa Hofstetler and an interview with the artist. Um, it is available online at Aperture and signed copies are also available through the George Eastman Museum. Um, I wanna say a quick thanks to those who made the book possible, which includes the Marion Goodman Gallery and the Barr Ferry Foundation Fund for Publication at Princeton University. Um, thanks also to Dana Faconti who designed it and of course, to James Welling, who I think I am happy to turn over this uh, presentation. Jim's going to take us through this body of work and then he and I will just have a brief um, a moment for Q&A. If there's anything left to talk about, we'll ask questions then. And following our Q&A, open it up as Nick mentioned to you, the audience. So thank you, Jim, over to you. Okay, um, can you hear me? Okay, great. 
Um, I want to thank Lisa Hostetler for uh, curating this beautiful show and Nick Marshall for uh, all the technical help today and earlier and the whole team at the George Eastman Museum for making the show possible. I came up to the museum uh, first in 2015, I think, for Lisa's show Matter of Memory. And uh, I came up in December also to look at the space and work on choreograph. And I'm just disappointed that because of COVID-19, it's not being seen as widely as it, it, as it could. Um, Leslie, uh, this is the second book I've worked with Leslie on, and I'm so happy that Aperture has published it. Dana Filconti was the designer, and we worked uh, for six months designing it. And I'm so happy that it, it came out as well as it did, and that's largely due to Danny Frank and Meridian Printing, who did a fantastic job on the uh, reproductions. I'm having a little trouble with my toggle uh, advancing. Hmm. There, okay. I'm not sure which, which button to press. Um, when I was a teenager, I had a photography book that uh, I did not study photography until I was in my 20s, but I loved to look at this photography book. It was called uh, Graphic Graphlex Photography from 1948. And in that book was this remarkable photograph by Barbara Morgan of Martha Graham and her dance. Uh, um, see, the section is called Come In Dear March, and the character March from a Emily Dickinson poem is performed by Merce Cunningham. And this picture always blew my mind that Merce Cunningham, who was in his late teens probably, appears to be flying. In any event, I went to art school uh, my freshman year. I, was, uh, I had a drawing teacher who actually had studied with Martha Graham, Gandy Brody. And so I was excited about Martha Graham and I knew who Merce Cunningham was. And the following year, the Merce Cunningham Dance Company, actually it was in 1970, came to Pittsburgh and performed uh, for a week. And they did this remarkable dance called Rainforest, which inspired me to take modern dance classes. And I studied dance for a year at the University of Pittsburgh and um, uh, then went to CalArts where I sort of dropped dance. And for 40 years, I let dance sort of linger in my consciousness. It's another image from Rainforest. The decor is by Andy Warhol, silver pillows that float on stage. Warhol, of course, uh, worked in silkscreen. And as I think back on choreograph and how I came to this strange photo process that I'm using, I realized that Warhol was one of the key figures. He used silk screen, photo silk screen, this electric chair painting from the mid 1960s. Of course, his more famous flowers where he blocks out large areas of the photo silk screen and applies pure color. Well, this is a type of photography. Warhol didn't invent it, it was actually called photo posterization. And photo posterization was very popular in the 1960s. So popular that Richard Avedon in 1968 went to England and photographed the Beatles and produced a portfolio of images using these same photo posterization techniques that Warhol and many other people uh, used. It's basically you break the image up into different light and dark values and then assign colors to them. So this is something that inspired me in choreograph. In 2013, I was invited to make a project along with nine other artists uh, to celebrate the Museum of Modern Arts Sculpture Garden. I decided to work with images of performance and this is a performance by Yoyo Kusama, I think in 1966, where she had unannounced to the museum a number of performers and herself frolic naked in the pond uh, at the museum in the sculpture garden. She, of course, told the press, so this is a New York Daily News photograph that I used, and then I layered in uh, my own photographs of the same space, you know, 50 years later. Around the same time, I was invited by the Wadsworth Athenaeum to do something, do some photographs for the opening of their re renovation. 
And I decided to work with a similar technique where I layered photographs on top of each other. This is outside the Wadsworth, the Tony Smith sculpture. So I was thinking about Warhol um, layering images. And then in 2014, I began to photograph uh, dance. Initially, I started with students. These are students in New York City uh, from uh, Loyola Marymount and uh, Barnard College. I gave all the students I created a source book, a Xerox book of images, dance imagery. This is uh, 1913 or so, Ballet Russe, uh, a dance called, um, I forget the name of the dance, it's, it means game, it's a, it's, a, it's a dance about a tennis game. And then I had uh, in California, UCLA art students who had been studying dance with the dancer, Simone Forti, I had them pose in this image. I guess the second, second from the uh, on the left-hand column, second down. And so I used lights, shot them on a large uh, white in a white gallery, and was able to sort of figure out what I wanted to do with dance and with layering of images. Another image that I showed them was this dance uh, by Doris Humphreys, The Shakers, 1933 or so. It was a dance that I actually performed in uh, when I was a dance student. So it was kind of nice to then instruct uh, this group of dancers to re re sort of restage that photograph. I also worked with imagery from more contemporary dance. This is Yvonne Rayner. And then this is the interpretation as the, uh, uh, the dancer improvised based on that pose. I didn't only use dance pictures, I used basically photographs that I found in the newspaper, or this is actually a Todd Papageorge photograph from his Central Park project. And Martha Graham, again, improvised by this dancer. Initially, I sort of put the dance together with any with other dance images uh, from the same shoot. Didn't it didn't work? And this is this picture, um, which is of the UCLA group, uh, was my first breakthrough image, and I want to walk you through how I made the picture. So, and if you move your I don't know, if I, in my screen, I'm covering the important part of the picture, which is on the right-hand side. It shows you uh, all of the modifications I made to the image and the channels. So if you can't see that, I'll just talk you through it. All color photographs are made of red, green, and blue channels. So I've taken off all the adjustments. And this is the picture where I put This photograph, a negative image of three dancers in the red channel. This picture, an upside down view of Marcel Breuer's uh, IBM Research Center in Florida in the green channel. I found that Marcel Breuer buildings, brutalist architecture works actually very well as one of the channels because of all of the flat planes. And then my favorite Tony Smith sculpture at the Wadsworth Athenaeum is the blue channel. So this is blue and green and back to all three channels. And then all working together with a few adjustments. Another image, this is the last of the images where I was working with posed students. This picture I photographed on West Street um, in Chelsea. And if you look on the left-hand side, you can see me uh, taking a photograph. So you have a picture of me making a photograph and then a photograph that I took 
as well as a third photograph. On most of the shoots, when I was able to, I worked with an assistant because when you're photographing dance, it's very hard to move through the, to, to, to get the, uh, the right shot because things are happening so quickly. Finally, the last influence um, for me with choreograph is artists like Robert Rauschenberg who used images stacked on top of each other and a process that we use in, that's used in printing, which is called make readies, where the printer to save money prints on scrap paper and you get an accumulation of images on top of each other. It turns out that besides Rauschenberg, a number of photographers were interested in this idea of stacking up images and the idea of the make ready. And this is a photograph by a New York based photographer named Scott Hyde, who I became very interested in and who was associated with the visual studies workshop. This is a photograph of three, possibly two pictures printed in different colored inks on top of it itself. And this is a photograph by another photographer, uh, New York based, but was associated with the visual studies workshop in Rochester, Sil Labrat, who worked directly with an offset press and uh, produced these pictures, superimpositions using a printing press. Something I discovered is that there are a lot of photographers in the 70s who are working in this manner, which I call multi-channel color, but they didn't have the means that today I have using an Epson printer and my Macintosh. So beginning in 2014, after working with students, I also began to photograph professional dance companies. This is the Stephen Petronio Dance Company. This is um, a version of the picture without any adjustments, and here it is. Oops, missed it. There, uh, there's the final, the final image. In addition to architecture, I put in uh, the dancers sometimes are in, in these landscapes. Uh, there's a set of fields that I used to walk when I was an adolescent. And the idea, one of the ideas of choreograph is that I'm putting these dancers into spaces, either architecture or landscape, because the root of choreograph, chora, means space in Greek. Another early dance performance I saw was the remarkable uh, Quebec dancer, Louisa Cavalier. And this is, these are some studies on the final, to get to the final picture, which is this one. So I'm gonna show you a few breakdowns. This is another tentative uh, version of the next picture, a dance by Kyle Abraham where I began to cut through the different channels. So you see the stacking up of the channels. Another performance by Kyle Abraham with a set by Glenn Ligon. Um, a French dance company. CNDC Angers, performing Merce Cunningham. So I was able to photograph a number of Cunningham performances, which was sort of closing the circle since Cunningham had originally inspired me. Terry O'Connor. Since I was living in Los Angeles until 2016, I photographed um, two very important LA dance companies. This is LA, um, contemporary Dance, LACDC. This is also LACDC from a dance called The Four Seasons, but in a number of these pictures, uh, I'm, I photograph the dancers as they're warming up or preparing. So this, I'll run through some variations. This is again in the three channels. Then adding some color adjustments this particular picture has a number of layers, like up to 20 layers, and I began to paint through the layers with a brush virtually. To 
till we get to the final image, which is this one. It's still a few more changes and, and steps. This is a picture of a work by Anna Teresa de Kersmaker, a Belgian choreographer at the Museum of Modern Art. Some of the dance performances like Kyle Abraham and this one, I don't put any architecture or landscape. So this is the elements in this picture are just the elements that I found at the museum during the performance. Another uh, dance performance by Simone Forti and her collaborator, Jeremiah Day. Here's a source, source image. I sent a photographer to San Francisco to photograph in Marin County on the beach structures, beach huts. And then this is the picture that resulted. It's uh, Liz Gehring Dance Company. I don't expect all of the elements to be visible, but I, I hope that viewers can sort of discern the dance, the architecture, the space. This sort of represents the, the, the first half of the of choreograph. This image, which like all of the ones I've been showing you were, were early pictures, that is as I was finding my way with the techniques I was evolving. This is Lucinda Child's dance company performing available light. I photographed it uh, in Philadelphia on a wickedly hot night. And I think probably to counteract that, I put a snow scene behind it. And then the architectural elements are a building that I sent someone to photograph in Switzerland, the Gutenheim by Rudolf Steiner. And so here you can see the extensions of the picture that it, it, it extends out and I made a more rectangular image. This is the snowy landscape. And this is the back cover of the book. This is a variation uh, right before I uh, created the picture that I just showed you. And this is the print. This image will be the print edition. Uh, I printed it on my inkjet printer the same way I would print all the other work in the show. So it's, um, and I really love the, uh, the difference between the, the front cover and the back cover of the book, this being the back. Another dance company I worked with was the LA Dance Project. I was able to photograph their rehearsals uh, and performances. And this is a, uh, another breakdown of some of the steps that were involved in making this the last picture in the catalog. It's a very white image, very light image. Um, but initially I started with these two dancers performing in a, a Merce Cunningham event. And I have a waterfall vertically arranged in the center of the picture. And uh, goes through a number of transformations. Eventually I, I got rid of the waterfall and I photographed some snow in Central Park and, and put that in, and then began to obscure the, the dancers' bodies with different layers and masks and erasures. And this is the final picture where the, the bodies blend into the background. The last group of, uh, significant group of dancers that I've worked with Kelly and Ger Gerard and Kelly, uh, a collaborative duo who I met when I was living in Los Angeles and they've done a number of uh, works. This is, um, this was performed, this particular work, um, which I've, uh, it's called Clockwork, was performed at the Brooklyn, um, in Brooklyn. Uh, the architecture is a uh, uh, Gaudi building in Barcelona. Gerard and Kelly 
also performed, uh, created a work called Modern Living, which they performed in uh, over six different venues, modern houses. This is at the Philip Johnson Glass House. What was remarkable about this in 2016, uh, Gerard and Kelly performed at the Glass House. But in 2008, I'd made a, a number of photographs of the same, the same spaces. So it was so, it was like, so again, like a kind of homecoming. I could photograph the same architecture that I'd already photographed, but with dancers. And that's a Kusama sculpture in the lake. Another variation on modern living. This was performed at the Farnsworth House in Illinois by Mies van der Rohe. And then back to the glass house where there's a dancer in the center left way, way down in the distance with uh, Anthony performing there. So the dance had a lot of spatial relationships uh, across these large, large uh, areas. And this is a dancer, um, Rochelle, performing the same part of the dance with another dancer, Lydia, in the distance. This is at the Schindler House in Los Angeles. And finally, in October, a year ago, uh, Gerard and Kelly performed a modern living in Le Corbusier's Villa Savoy in France. And even though I wasn't able to go there, I was able to uh, hire a photographer to photograph it. And so I took their photographs and I then went to Villa Savoy in January of, this, of 2020 and photographed the architecture. So I put my pictures of architecture with these commissioned pictures of the dance. Another very late photograph that I made in November. This is a uh, lecture by Mario Gooden, an architect up at Columbia, and um, Jonathan Gonzalez doing a, a performance. The lecture was about water, and so Jonathan is uh, working with these jugs of water. This picture uh, has no color transformations, it's just stacking images and cutting them to fit, fit together. There's also a video projection of Jonathan, which looks like another channel, but it's actually uh, in the image. And finally, the last two uh, works that I'll show you, again, the most recent dance pictures just before the world shut down, um, Pam Tanowitz, dance company performed in Los Angeles at Royce Hall. And I sent my assistant uh, who had photographed some of the other dance performances to Royce Hall to photograph Pam Tanowitz's four quartets with set, sets by Bryce Marden. I read about this dance. It was performed up at Bard College a couple of years ago, but it had not come to New York. So I was very, um, uh, it was gratifying to be able to work with uh, the company, they permitted me to dance, to photograph um, the dance and then make these two works. In all cases, I've been working with the dance companies, um, giving the dancers prints and the company prints. Um, so it's not exactly a collaboration, but I'm sharing uh, what I've done with all the dance companies. And finally, back to the museum. Um, Here's the print. And I'll quickly hop out and we will look at um, the 3D um, walkthrough of the space. I can find it. There we go. So this is something that I've seen a few other uh, gallery shows this way, and it's definitely a COVID-specific way to look at 
look at art, but this is a three-dimensional uh, tour. When you come in the front door, you see this early picture of the Kusama performance, which was uh, very important. This photograph based on the Yvonne Rayner dance picture with one of my students. And then the Barnard students, LA Dance Project, Lucinda Childs, LA Dance Project again, Gerard and Kelly. And then in this room, there are some of my inspirations uh, for choreograph, a print by Syl Labrat, a different one than, than I showed. And these are the Richard Avedon. It's called the Moondrops Campaign, very similar to the Beatles, a poster, photo posterization, another photo posterization by Bert Stern, and then some very strange uh, photographs by Edward Steichen of uh, flowers where he worked with what I call multi-channel color and dye transfer. And then in the second room, small selection of pictures with a quote by Ovid. When I was working on choreograph, I began to read The Metamorphosis by Ovid. And the first line is, my mind is bent to tell of bodies changed into new forms. And that for me was the perfect uh, epigram for choreograph because I, I did want to work with bodies and I wanted them to kind of merge with the landscape uh, and architecture. So I think with this uh, picture, we can, I can bring in Leslie to see if she has any observations or comments. We had a wonderful, uh, there's a wonderful interview in the catalog where uh, we talked on two different occasions in uh, December and January. And then um, we'll see if Leslie has anything else to suggest. Always lots to talk about with you and your work, Jim. Thank you for that um, walkthrough. Really great to see the different processes and on a dreary rainy day, in indoors, it's so nice to be immersed in these colors and forms and movement. So thank you. Um, I guess I'm going to start with something really super basic and process oriented. Um, again, you took us through those different channels, showing us processes of layering, of removal, and I'm I'm curious if you could speak to how do you know when an image is done when it's fully resolved and in its final form? Well, when you work this way, very simply put uh, using Photoshop and put three different pictures in the color channels, you've got a very ugly uh, picture. Uh, it's kind of purple and uh, uh, red and green. And uh, so then I start working on uh, making transformations and initially that the first picture, that greenish uh, photograph that I described as my sort of breakthrough picture, that one has only a few, few transformations and I can still see the different channels very clearly. And as I kept working uh, with just tons of failures, I think this project is, uh, I had more I left more pictures in the trash than any other body of work. I, I really tried to move away from the red, green, and blue channels and to really transform them into something else. And so Photoshop has a lot of powerful tools to do that, but it took me quite a long time, uh, at least six months to arrive, to begin to arrive at pictures that I, I thought were, uh, more sophisticated, or more interesting, that, that departed from what I was just getting um, when I put the, the photographs into the channels. So it's a process of trial and error and you just know it when you see it. Trial and error, for sure. Uh, two, there are two things about this. One is when you work digitally, you can make 
radical transformations very quickly, which is not the case, say, if I were doing this in silkscreen or painting. You know, in, in an hour, I can work through just a wild number of variations. So there's that. Um, I forgot what the second idea was, but um, that, that this, I, this ability to work quickly, I think is something that is a, a hallmark of digital, digital photography. Uh, and it sort of relates a little bit to something you talk about in relation to this work about this exploration of these very wild, vibrant, psychedelic sort of colors as an exploration of one of photography's dead end or a damned form of photography. And you've shown a couple of exa examples, the Sil Labrat, um, the Scott Hyde. I would also say that the Bee Nettles, which is also currently up at the Eastman Museum is another, you know, very, um, very much an exploration of what we might see as damned forms that actually is having a real recurrence in contemporary photography right now. But I guess I'm, I'm interested that maybe it's this speed of trial and error and ease of process through Photoshop that has allowed you to pick this back up again? Or is that why these forms became damned or dead ends originally? Because they were too slow, too cumbersome? Well, uh, when I began to do this, I initially had started with doing stuff on film, street, red, green, and blue exposures on film and printing them and you know, kind of straight demonstrations of trichromatic, how trichromatic color works. But then I bought my first inkjet printer. And for me, the inkjet printer is a new medium. It's not the same as chemical analog photography because it, the, the ink appears to me to be so thick. So that was the one thing that I discovered in the Philip Johnson pictures that the, the, the medium was different. Um, I regret to, I, I'm very uh, humble realizing that I only discovered B. Nettles work two weeks ago when I looked at the um, Radiate show online uh, at uh, Visual Studies Workshop. I don't know if the show's still up or when it, when it took place, but her work is, is featured in that show, which is one of the artists. And it was just really surprising. I mean, B, um, some of Joan Lyon's work, other, other practitioners in the 1970s. We talk about this in the interview. For me, the 70s are a period of time when photography you know, comes of age in terms of color. So you have something called the new color photography which is more or less based on a kind of, you could say Walker Evans model of looking at the kind of vernacular world, but printing it and seeing it in color. And, you know, I love all that work. That's what I, that got, that's what got me into photography. But as I sort of backed my way into unconventional color, partly because I just didn't think I had anything to contribute to this, the, the new color, uh, as I backed my way into psychedelia, I realized that that was the damned, that was the forgotten, that was the third rail of photography. A friend of mine, when he looked at my choreographed pictures, he said, they look a lot like design. Like, and that, that being a pejorative, yeah. that uh, these amazing tools that we have in photography that the practitioners in the 1970s did not have or did have very, had very rudimentary uh, versions of offset printing or silkscreen or color Xerox. Today we have all of these remarkable tools and I'm just uh, you know, very excited about continuing to explore them. And as, I, as you referenced, there are a lot of artists doing this uh, and that's uh, gratifying to see this legacy um, begun 50 years ago with a truly new color photography being uh, embraced by other other photographers. Well, and it's, it's interesting too. I mean, we think of, you mentioned, you know, the new color, which is so closely associated with the new topographics, which also, of course, had its origin in an exhibition that was at the George Eastman Museum. And then this other sideline of constant experimentation and new forms that was happening at the visual studies workshop. And again, the artists we've just cited, they sort of, there's this range 
between those two. And you have occupied many of the positions in between those two poles, I would say. Um, and I'm gonna reference something that you mentioned in an interview with Eva Rispini in the wonderful book Monograph, which I will just say was our first uh, publication together and was a great toolkit for all the things I needed to understand in your work. Um, but you mentioned the idea of your interest in photography as akin to this chess move that I had never heard about, but it's called the Knight's Tour. And this is a phrase that Hollis Frampton, I guess, used to describe how on a chess piece, the knight can take this path to explore every single position possible on a chessboard. And I feel like that's kind of what you do with photography, you know, from things that are very classical, black and white, straight, architectural photography to something that's as experimental as this. And I'm just curious how you move between these positions and what those connecting threads are for you. Um, I, um, I'm teaching a class this semester at Princeton called Pathological Color, which is now what I call multi-channel color. It's uh, it's a term from Goethe, basically color uh, kind of malady. Uh, he, he talks about color blindness, but pathological color is a great way to describe this, this sort of new color. But uh, for the class last week, I had the artist Matthew Brandt talk about his work. And Matthew kind of invents a new photo process for every single body of work, as it were, using blood and sweat for salt and paper prints, or a blowtorch and trichromatic separations for pictures of icebergs. He described a new process where he did a show in, in Georgia and he used the recipe for peach pie as a photo sensitizer. So this idea that the medium and the subject in photography can twist and turn and have some sort of like dance is a, uh, a notion that I mean, Matt made it very clear in his lecture that this, he was very, he was interested in like a new process for every body of work. Uh, I don't, I don't go that far, uh, but I do, uh, I came, I, I do try to, you know, think about, you know, the appropriate display vehicle. And I came of age as a artist that valued probably, at least for me, it seemed that the value was placed on formal innovation. And so for better or worse, my thinking about how to be an artist is to, quote, evolve or change my work or uh, uh, be open to looking at new ways of getting images onto paper. And so that uh, that's a little bit of the night's tour uh, that you referenced. Hollis Frampton talks about, you know, he makes a film, I uh, forget the name of it, um, an early film where he kind of goes through all of these different permutations of the same like 30 second uh, piece of film and, and, and does it in negative, does it positive, inverted color, splotches. So it's this manual of arms, I think it's called. So in a way, I am a child of the late 60s, early 70s, when this was the, the way you, you became an artist, you, you worked with the, the medium and you innovated. Again, trying to find a subject matter that's appropriate. So in choreograph, I don't think this almost random colors that I'm getting have much to do with, say, Merce Cunningham or John Cage's you know, use of uh, chance, but there is a, a connection because I was, you know, very impressed by Cage and Cunningham at this formative period in my life. Mm -hmm. One one of the things that um, Lisa Hostetler, again, who is the curator of the exhibition and uh, contributes a great essay connecting some of these very experimental and formal innovations with some points in the history of photography. Um, she also talks about the emotional 
content of abstraction. And I, I, I know that's something that you aren't necessarily thinking about or aiming for, but um, you, there is something very bright and colorful and, and optimistic and happy in the choices of colors mm. for the most part. Um, and the things that you're layering, you have an emotional or a personal connection to. So how, how much are you thinking about? Is that just a byproduct of process? Like, how does this, would you say there's an emotional content to these experimentations? Um, there's a, the, the, I think the emotional content is being, uh, is my love of, of modern dance. And uh, even though I don't think I was a very good dancer, it was a, I spent a, one fearless year uh, studying dance and throwing everything I had into it. Um, so it's partly this memory of uh, a very exciting period in my life, combined with uh, a lot of these spaces that I've always wanted to work with, these sort of snowy landscapes. Uh, of again adolescence, but um, so none of this I think is important for the viewer to know. But it certainly um, propelled me into this body of work. So I don't think um, the the emotion, like you know, bright colors. Uh, I you know, not, not sure what to say about that. I do have some very gloomy choreographs, but uh, you know, it's sort of uh, I'm not using all of the keys on the keyboard. My friend Glenn Branca said that, uh, he was telling me about Beethoven's uh, Emperor Concerto, and he said that Beethoven uses all the keys on the keyboard. And that's kind of what I want to do in choreograph, is use all the colors in the uh, inkjet printer. I mean, that would also probably apply to your interest in photography. And again, sort of back to the night's nice tour, you just want to use all the keys on the keyboard. You know, in terms of like emotion, in photography, you know, there's the subject, which is mostly connected, emotional subjects. But for me, there is something just emotional in transcribing the world photographically. That is, and, and, and any photographer knows this, there's, some, there's an excitement. You do it because you're really excited about what happens, that magic that happens in the dark room or on the screen and uh, hopefully that excitement that, you know comes through in anyone's work i see i mean i i it's one of the things i love about your work jim is that it is always a reminder no matter how far these explorations are pushed of that um the sort of magic of the photographic in some way in its process and its in its subject, whatever it is. Um, I do see that Nick has popped on and I think that might mean that we have questions from the audience, I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll start with the first question here, which, which I know you've touched on a little bit, but maybe just um, kind of uh, elaborating on it a little bit. Uh, the question was, how do you decide which dance works with which landscape or architecture piece? Do they have any link at all? Um, very tenuous link. There's one photograph I showed of Simone Porti and uh, Jeremiah Day, and um, they are both very um, activist performers. And so I put a picture of a Trump anti-Trump demonstration in the background. I'm trying to think of a few other examples where there is a direct connection. Um, the Villa Savoy, uh, Gerard and Kelly, they, uh, so there was that connection. But in general, um, there is not a direct linkage. It's really, I'm searching for some sort of background image that will quote unquote work. Yeah, so maybe aesthetic decisions are kind of more informing the- To, to some extent, but- Compositional. And there's also just the random, not knowing what's gonna work and just throwing a lot of things at the picture and then, and then learning that 
that this works, this doesn't work. Um, so there's both the specific content in a few pictures, which is which is important, but then there's the the other the procedures. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, another uh, question was: uh, It seemed to me that the last two photos you showed were ones where bodies were a bit more distant from the landscape background. Uh, any comments on where your process may be taken next? Um, yes. So the last group of pictures that I made, um, you know, the, the, the series really ended about a year and a half ago. And then because I wanted to include the Pam Tanowitz and the Gerard and Kelly, those pictures and the um, Jonathan Gonzalez, those pictures are slightly different. There's not a lot of layering. Um, I'm just slowly manipulating the color the way you would with a, in a traditional color photograph. So I've, I'm, I'm less interested in just the garish colors. The, 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 I'm, I've dropped out of my PDF. I can't go back to it. But um, the uh, later pictures are, are more subtle and subdued. So there's less connection to architecture, say, or landscape. Mm. Um, the question uh, kind of shifting uh, away from this work, but, or I don't know, actually maybe not shifting away from this work, but I think maybe your work as a whole. Did you take any drawing or painting classes while you're in art school? If so, how has it affected your work? Um, I was a fine arts major. I proud to say I never took a photography class. Uh, so my first two years at Carnegie Mellon, when I was studying dance, I was drawing and painting. And um, how has it affected my work? I think I've always, I've only been interested in working on paper. So this, you know, never, never did oil painting, never did painting on canvas. It was always acrylic on paper or drawing or watercolor. Um, so that, that's been a through line. Everything I've done has been on, on paper and there are certain aqueous um, imagery in these in choreograph that I wish I could do it in paint. Uh, I've, I've experimented putting different washes of uh, acrylic and watercolor on inkjets. Never seems to work out. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now I'm actually working on a different process, different body of work where I'm uh, using oil paint on um, laser prints. So yes, painting and drawing are very important to me. I mean, I would even say that the eraser tool yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of acts as, you, as your, your drawing uh, <laughs> yeah. or uh, your kind of charcoal reduction. Or <laughs> if you look at the list of my studio receipts, it's 95% art supplies and 5% photo. <laughs> Um, what does the, uh, what role does scale play in the size of your prints? When I was first starting out on choreograph, I, um, I didn't understand how big the bodies had to be. Hmm. And subsequently I've learned that here, Rochelle is near life size. She's not life size because this is a 40 by 60 inch print, but Almost all of the uh, the bodies in the work have to be of a certain size. So that was the um, the size thing that I learned that I couldn't have. Very few pictures have small figures. I want to have the figures grab you. Great. Um, so I think uh, we may need to leave things off there. Um, okay. Oh wait. I, I've got one more question I'm going to get to. Have you considered printing on canvas and then applying a coat of paint? Uh, yes, I have. And I've, um, I tried it and whatever I was using, whatever material I was using, uh, just it didn't work. Um, so, you know, I, even though I'd love to, to get my hand involved in the work, I know that there's something also really compelling about not doing that. And very, um, I'm not a purist. 
I would do it if I, if I uh, was able to get it to work, but I haven't gotten it to work. So uh, I keep looking at canvas. I've, I've been recently printing on silk, trying to imagine how these pictures could look on silk using dye sublimation. But again, nothing, nothing yet. So stay tuned. Um, is the body, is this body of work finished? Or are you continuing to work with layers in psychedelic colors? It's finished in that I'm not photographing dance anymore. It's actually, you know, COVID kind of put it to rest. Yeah. And I'm working on other things, but I have a whole group of pictures that come directly out of Ovid and these bodies. It has to do with antiquity and Greek sculpture. So choreograph led me to the origins of modern dance, which is like Isadora Duncan and a early ballet fascination with um, Greek sculpture, et cetera. So I've now transitioned backwards uh, 2000 years uh, into uh, antiquity. And choreograph took me there. So choreograph is, is finished. That is, it's completed. All right, one last question just came in and then this is gonna be it. Um, can you tell us about the new Street View work on your website? Very different visual language, trying to understand how you choose your technique to subject matter. So once COVID hit, I, um, I was struck by, well, the view out my window um, there's really very little going on. And then I began to see a lot of bike messengers and uh, pedestrians on the street with masks. So I set up a, got a telephoto lens and began to photograph out, out my window. And I thought the connection to choreograph is that there's a uh, relationship between the, the bodies on the street and, uh, uh, you know, it's like a kind of dance, people in, in crosswalks, people passing. So there is a, a very faint connection to choreograph, but I'm now much more interested in the sort of dialogue between sunlight and shadow and cars and bikes and moving vans and everything that's happening on the street. So it's a very different endeavor for me to do street photography, which of course I'm not known for. And it's, street view is what you know Google calls their, their, their mapping. So it's, I've, I've got my street view but it does connect in a very subtle way to choreograph. Yeah. Great, well, thanks for uh, going through those questions with us. Um, Leslie or Jim, do, do either of you have a book on hand that you can hold up? There it awesome. is. It's really just a beautifully done book. Um, so I uh, encourage you all to check out the book. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Aperture. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, again, this is recorded and we will be posting it on our YouTube uh, through the museum. And I know Aperture will be sharing it as well. So I uh, hope you can check out the book, check out the exhibition. And uh, our next program is on um, next Thursday at 6 p.m. we're having an artist talk with Kota Izawa. Uh, so uh, that's at 6 p.m. Uh, feel free to join us for that free program as well. And Leslie, do you guys have anything that you want to plug real quick? Oh gosh, there's always something. I encourage people to check out aperture.org. We have a, um, a live uh, free of charge virtual gala coming up on Tuesday evening. And that's in honor of the photographer Ming Smith and the esteemed historian Naomi Rosenblum. So people can log on, there's a whole program, but lots of stuff to explore in aperture.org. Thank you guys for this opportunity. And, and I have a show in Los Angeles, Regan Projects, that was just featured in uh, LA platform. But if you go to Regan Projects Los Angeles, you can see what a new work looks like. Great. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, hope to see you all virtually again soon and, and really hope to see some of you all in person at some point here. So uh, take care, everyone.